If those who do the will of the Father end up like corrupt people, if those who do the will of the Father end up like prostitutes, if those who do the will of the Father end up the same way like dogs, what's the use? The Apostle Paul is making a very powerful argument that if the dead, if Christ is not risen, your faith is fruitful. You are still in your sins. Now, let's, let, let's look at this, brothers and sisters. On Friday, Christ dies. On Friday, Christ dies. What that means is that, according to the Apostle Paul, when Christ dies on Friday... Christians or those that believed in him were still in their sins come Sabbath or Saturday. And on Sunday, if Christ did not rise, they were still in their sins. That's the argument that the Apostle Paul is making. If Christ is not risen, your faith is fruitful. You are still in your sins. So the resurrection from the dead becomes very important. Then also those who have fallen asleep in trust have perished. But brothers and sisters, there's a message of hope. Trust rose. He rose from the dead. And those that follow him, he has assured victory over the grave. He has assured also victory over sin. The Bible, which is the inspired word of God, not tradition, the Bible, the inspired word of God, which is given by inspiration of God, which is profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for reproof, profitable for correction, profitable that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Bible tells us, brothers and sisters, that the subject of death has to be understood in the context of the creation of mankind. Genesis chapter 3, verse 18. You shall eat the herb of the field. This is God speaking to Adam and Eve. And this is after the fall of mankind. So God speaks to Adam and he says, You shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Or maybe I didn't read properly. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to heaven. Is that what the Bible says? No. The Bible says, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it, you were taken. Or has that verse said you were taken from heaven? No. For out of it you were taken. And then he's addressing a complete entity of Adam. And he talks to Adam and he says, For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So human beings, according to this verse, human beings are dust. They were created from the dust 
and to dust they return. Now, notice brothers and sisters that the words that God uses here are being addressed to a person. A complete person. This is a person who is alive and can understand the words that God is speaking. Adam, you are dust. And to dust you shall return. And the Lord God, which is why we have to understand, since Genesis chapter 3 has told us that Adam, he is dust, that we then need to understand or to investigate the scriptures. How was a human being created? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man received a soul. Is that what the Bible says? Is the Bible saying that man received a soul? No. And man became a living being. Man became a living being. So, a human being, the body of the human being, with all its parts, were formed from the dust of the ground. So God stooped low, got the dust from the ground, and after he had formed the body of man, and in that body there was a brain, in that body there were eyes, in that body there were hands, in that body there was everything that is found on a human being. But those things were not functioning. When God breathed into the nostrils of man, or of breathe into the nostrils of the body, then man became a living soul. Now, it's very important to understand this because once you miss this part, you miss what happens when we die. The creation of man and death are opposites of each other or the reversal of each other. So, creation is dust plus the breath of life. You then get a living being. So, someone who can think, someone that can feel, someone that can see, someone that can act, someone that can love, someone that can hate. The opposite of that, or separating the two elements, produces what is called death. So, brothers and sisters, body plus breath equals a living soul. Body plus breath equals a living soul. Which means that when you reverse this, the living person minus breath equals a corpse or a lifeless body. That's, that, that it, it has to be understand, understood as the Bible says it. So man did not receive a soul, but man became. He became a living soul. So two parts, the body or the dust of the ground plus the breath produces a living been. So when we die, it's just the reverse. The breath 
leaves the man or leaves the woman or leaves the person. And because of that, death results. I hope we are together so far. And because of the nature of this subject, because of the deception surrounding this subject, today I decided that I'm going to take it slow so that we are together. So, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 7, it says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, verse 18, For dust you are, and dust you shall return. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Now, I will come back later to show you what the spirit is. Because there are many who want to believe that the spirit is a cognitive thing. Something that reasons. Something that comes out of the body and can look back at the body to say, that was my body. That's what, um, that, that belief. But that belief, brothers and sisters, is a pagan belief. I did show you in Voices from Beyond the Grave. There is nothing that comes out of man which is conscious. The spirit as used here will have to be understood in its original context. What word was used in Hebrew for the word spirit? So basically, what the wise man here, Solomon, is telling us is that when we die, the body goes back to the dust and the breath or the spirit goes back to God who gave it. So, Job tells us something about death. Now, you need to understand that when we deal with the subject of death, because of the consistency, because the Bible writers were used by the same spirit. They cannot contradict each other. Because God is a God of order. So if Job is used by God to speak about the subject of death, he will speak in harmony with Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. And to speak in harmony with Moses in the book of Genesis. Now, Job chapter 2, chapter 27, verse 3, it says, All the while, my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Now, what is happening here is what is called Hebrew parallelism. Hebrew Parallelism, where an idea is expressed in this way and then expressed in the other way. The word, my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. The spirit, can you imagine the spirit of God being in the nostrils? Job, what Job is talking about here is one and the same thing. The spirit of God and breath are one and the same thing. Expressing it in this way and then expressing it in that way. This is quite very common with Hebrew writers. So, my, all the while my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. So basically the spirit of God and breath are one and the same thing. So, let's recap. So, Jesus Christ, the creator of the heavens and the earth, because the Bible tells us all things were made by him, and without him, nothing that is made was made. So, 
Christ is the active agent when it comes to creation. So Christ stooped and formed Adam from the dust of the ground. And then he then breathed into the nostrils of Adam the breath of life. So what the breath of life did, it made the lifeless body to start functioning. Now, get me very uh, closely here. The brain which thinks is not in the breath. The brain that thinks is in the body. But the brain without the breath cannot function. The feelings that we have are, where, are embedded in the body. But those feelings cease to function when the breath lives. So the breath is the power that activates every function of the body to start functioning. But that breath is not something that is conscious. Consciousness in man comes when the breath is still in them. When the breath leaves, consciousness ceases to exist. So man becomes as good as a stone. Man becomes as good as a lifeless chair. Something that doesn't think. That's the reason why when people die, you have to do everything for them. So understanding the creation of how man was made helps us to understand what happens to us when we die. David, on the other hand, puts it like this. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of man, in whom there is no help. There are so many today who brag about having connections. I am connected. I am connected. And I am connected. Well, the best connection you can ever have is the connection with God. The connection, whether you are connected to the president, or you are connected to Donald Trump, or you are connected to whoever is the most powerful human being, David warns us against putting our trust in man. No, in princes or kings. Why is he saying that? Why is he saying don't put your trust in this? Well, the answer he gives us himself. David, why are you telling us don't put your trust in human beings? He gives us the answer. His breath goeth forth. He returneth to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. If I were to ask you, how much do you remember of what the earth was before you were born? You, you didn't know anything. You were not there. So when we die, everything ceases at zero. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. Basically, he returns to the ground or he goes back to dust because dust you are and to dust you shall return. That's the reason why don't brag about your connections, the connections that you have. Those individuals or people that you trust, their breath will go forth and they will cease to exist. And they can't help you anymore. But you can put your trust in Emmanuel, God the Son. God with us. He ever lives to make intercession for us. He has conquered death. Those connections you talk about, they can't resurrect you. The connections that I'm introducing to you this Sabbath afternoon is the connection with heaven. He has conquered sin. He has conquered 
death. And all of us, brothers and sisters, in the face of death, we become hopeless. Or oh, there are some men who have too much money. In the face of death, they would exchange all their wealth for life. His thoughts perish. And someone whose thoughts perish, it means that that person can't think. Now, a mad person, when we talk of a mad person, a mad person thinks but is thinking is just weird. But when we talk about a dead person not thinking, <laughs> it's not thinking. You see, the arguments that the Bible writers bring forth are very strong. When you listen to the wise man, Solomon, he continues, he says, for the living know that they will die. But the dead know nothing. Now, which part of the verse know nothing do you not understand? Which part of that verse is, is, is complicated for you? The living, you and I, right now, you can listen to the word of God because there is still breath in your nostrils. You can choose Jesus Christ because there is still breath in your nostrils. But when the breath leaves you, you join a group of the dead who know nothing. You can't hear anything. You can't help anyone. You don't think. You have expired. You have expired. The only contribution you make to the world when you die is just stinking. That's the only contribution you make. It's only stinking. Because of sin, when human beings die, we stink. Because why? Because we start rotting. Corruption kicks in immediately. So, Solomon here in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5 has a very strong argument. For the living know that they will die. But the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward. You've got no more reward. You can't be rewarded with a degree when you, are, you die. Of course, they will say, um, we are rewarding impostors, but you can't use it. You've got no more reward. You can't use it. For the memory of them is forgotten. The memory of them is forgotten. Brothers and sisters, the Bible is very clear that the dead know nothing. If the dead go to heaven, then they know something. But because they don't go to heaven, they know nothing. They don't know when a daughter gets married. They don't know if the child has turned into a prostitute. They don't know if the child has turned to drug addiction. They do not know if a child has turned into a preacher. They don't know whether the child has gone to university. The dead know nothing. And knowing nothing is knowing zero. It's knowing nothing. Also, verse 6, also their love. So if you want to love, it's now when you still have breath in you. Their hatred, their envy have now perished. So the dead do not hate. The living are the ones who hate. The dead don't hate anyone. They don't even love anyone. They don't envy anything. 
In other words, they don't participate in anything that goes on under the sun. You only participate what goes on under the sun whilst you are still alive. Whilst there is still breath in your nostrils. That's why the wise man tells us, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your mighty. For in the grave, not in heaven, in the grave where you are going, not you are going, in the grave where you are going, there is neither device nor work. So if you want to love your children, love them now. If you want to love your wife, love your wife now. If you want to do something for your Lord, do it now. If you want to participate in the cause and in the proclamation of the gospel, you can do it in the grave. They allow their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. So the dead, they know nothing. How much do they know? They know nothing. Absolutely nothing. Psalm 115 verse 17. The dead do not praise the Lord. So how can you say that the dead go to heaven? Because if we, when you go to heaven, you will praise the Lord. So why are you telling people that your mother or your father or your uncle or your child is in heaven? When the dead do not praise the Lord. Because heaven, the beings that are in heaven, they praise the Lord. So if you are amongst them, then you would praise the Lord. But the psalmist here is telling us the dead do not praise the Lord. Nor any who go down into, and he uses the word who go down into what? Into silence. When we die, we zip up. Zip up our mouths. We can't say anything. We can't hear anything. If you want to say something to your wife, you have to say it whilst you are still alive. If you want to say something to your children, you have to say something whilst you are still alive. Because where the dead go to in the grave, when they return to dust, there is silence there. So when you go to the graveyard and you hear voices there, just know that those are not the dead. Those are living human beings. When you go to the graveyard and you leave your drink there. The following day you find someone has drunk it. The dead have not drunk it. The living have drunk whatever you left. If you go, you bury money in the graveyard because you store it with your intention of coming to get it the following day and you find it's not there. Just know that the dead did not get your money. The living did. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. You zip up. You zip up. Job 14, verse 14. If a man dies, shall he live again? So Job is asking a question. And he's asking a question for which he knows the answer. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my heart service, I will wait till my change comes. You shall call and I will answer you. Why should the Lord call when you are in heaven? And what change is he talking about here? Remember, as we go on, um, we will show you that what will happen to us is that when we die, there's going to be a resurrection. It is at the resurrection that the change comes. But the people who are resurrected will be coming from their graves. So, 
the those that are dead, the body would have decomposed. It will be part of the dust of the ground. But God has, remember he's the one who breathed into our nostrils. So when he comes, he's coming with the breath with him. And he needs a body and so when he calls out, he recomposes. He makes the body again. Oh yes, nothing is impossible with God. Whether you were, someone is eaten by a shark or they were involved in an accident such that you can't even pick anything, it doesn't matter with him. The body at the resurrection will be recomposed. You shall call and I will answer you. Job 7 verse 9 As the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down. Now, listen to the Bible writers. All of them, there's no Bible writer who is talking about going to heaven here. So far, in all our discourse, there is only one verse that was talking about returning to God. And what was returning was the spirit, was the breath. I will show you that in the original, what the word spirit means. As the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. Does not come up, at least until the resurrection. No, my, um, my grandmother who died usually appears. That is not your grandmother. I dealt with that subject in Voices Beyond the Graves. If anyone who is dead is appearing, that is not your dead relative. Those are demons impersonating your dead grandmother. So, he who goes, you go down, you, 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 you go six feet, you don't go to heaven, you don't go to a realm to go and wait, you don't go to purgatory. These are doctrines of pagans. Paganism is the one that believes in you go to heaven, and apparently, Almost everyone who dies is in heaven. By those who do not understand this subject. Almost everyone who dies, or is he, right now, is with the Lord. Is enjoying himself in heaven. No, 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 no. no. Do not deceive people. He is not with the Lord. He is in the grave. Or if you haven't yet buried, he is in the coffin. Or if you have not yet reached that stage, he is in the mortuary. The dead go down and they don't come up. Job 7 verse 10, he shall never return to his house. So your grandmother who is uh, returning or your brother or your father who is coming, who are they? The Bible says he will never return to his house. Nor shall his place know him anymore. So when I die, that's it. I cannot again come back and say, no, I watch over my children. No, the time to watch over my children is whilst I'm still alive. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with what? With all your might, because there is no work in the grave. He shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him any more. For the living, you and I, we know that you will die. But the dead know how many? Nothing. 
They know nothing. So we are doing the state of the dead today so that you are not deceived because it becomes the foundation through which Babylon will deceive many. Demons will play around this subject to impersonate your dead relatives. They will come. They will speak in the voice that you are familiar with. They will tell you things that people perhaps may not know. But do not believe that. Don't believe it. Believe the word of God. Believe the word of God. Your brothers and your sisters, my brothers and my sisters, my relatives, our friends who have died are in the graves. And what do they know? They know nothing. They have returned to the dust. They can't feel any pain. They can't feel any love. They don't know anything. They don't participate in anything that happens in the world. So when you do your memorial services and all those things and you take flowers there and you go and put them on the graves and all those things, strictly speaking, you're just doing them for yourself. Because whether you took flowers there or you did not take flowers, your dead relative does not know whether you have taken flowers or you haven't. They don't. So one song says, don't scatter roses when I'm gone. Give the roses whilst human beings are still alive. Don't waste your money on someone who is dead. We will not appreciate them. Waste your money whilst they can still appreciate them. Job 17, verse 13. If I wait, the grave is mine house. Did you get that? If I wait, the grave is mine house. I have made my bed in the darkness. Yes, all human beings make their beds in darkness. They make their beds in the... You don't wait in heaven. You don't wait in purgatory. You don't wait in hell. You don't wait in the realm. You don't wait in form of another being. No. You wait in the grave. The grave becomes the house of all who have died till the resurrection. Job 14, verse 10. But man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last. And where is he? Where is he? Basically, Job is telling us here by asking that question, where is he? In other words, he's saying he's nowhere. He's nowhere. He hasn't changed into some other form. He's nowhere. He breathes his last. And where is he? So man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. When will the heavens be no more? When will the heavens be no more? At the second coming of trust. The heavens will roar away like a scroll. At the second coming of Christ, when he comes in power and in glory, the heavens will be no more. So man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake. Did you get that? Okay? Did you get that? They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. Oh, so Job uses the word sleep. 
Okay? So man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. So Job calls death a sleep. He calls death a sleep. And when you are sleeping, you can't be sleeping in your bedroom at the same time be in your kitchen. Then you are a witch or something else. But human beings, when you are sleeping in your bedroom, you are in the bedroom. When you are seated or sleeping on your couch in the living room, that is where you are. But it's telling us there that a man, when they die, they breathe their last, they are laid down, they are not awakened till the heavens are no more at the second coming of Christ. Then Job again continues with his argument. He says, all that you would hide me in the grave. That you would conceal me until your wrath is past. Or that you would hide me in the grave. That you would conceal me until your wrath is past. Because the dead, they don't feel pain. A dead person can't feel pain. You can, you can cut them in pieces. They will not feel pain. The living are the ones who feel pain. And pain is inflicted on the living by wicked people so that they die. So how can it be that when you are living, you feel pain? When you are dead again, you feel pain. It can't be. So Job here is making an, an argument. And the argument that Job is making here is that, look, uh, when I am in the grave, when I am dead, coronavirus does not, will not affect me. The wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, will not affect the dead. The living are the ones who feel. That you would appoint me a set time and remember me. When is the set time, brothers and sisters? It's at the resurrection. At the resurrection. At least for Job, he's looking at the resurrection of the righteous. What about you? Which resurrection, perhaps, will you be looking at? Is it the resurrection to life or the resurrection to condemnation? When you accept Christ as your personal savior, death is a pause. In your life. You sleep in the palms of God. And God does not forget his children. At the second coming, he says, Awake ye that sleep in the dust of the earth. Remember, blessed and blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. At the same time also, the Bible tells us, blessed are the dead in the Lord from henceforth, that they may rest from their labors, and their works follow them. So death is a sleep. Death my brothers and sisters, friends, is just but asleep. Psalm 13, verse 13, Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Here is another Bible writer, agreeing with what Job 
was saying, that death is our sleep. So when we die, we sleep. The sleep of death. And when we sleep the sleep of death, we are unconscious. So, my brothers and sisters, in the new apostolic church, you don't go to the road. My friends, my relatives, in the Roman Catholic Church, you don't go to purgatory, you don't go to heaven, you sleep. That is the reason why in the Roman Catholic Church, people end up paying money for their dead relatives so that this, the so-called the soul of their dead relatives, which is in purgatory, may fly from purgatory to heaven. Now that is buying salvation. Or you start praying for those who have died so that God may have mercy on them. No, you pray for the living so that they make a choice whilst they are still alive. You don't pray for someone who is dead. Someone who is dead, their record is closed. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. So you choose to follow God or not to follow him whilst you still have life. When you lose life, when you die, your record is closed. And what goes into the judgment, brothers and sisters, as I discussed last Sabbath, is your works up to the point of death. What you did, did you accept Christ as your personal savior? Was Jesus' work on the cross in vain for you? Or it was all worth it? Did Christ die in vain? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So, the wicked and the righteous, they both sleep in the dust of the earth. No pain, no worry, nothing. Sleep. They just sleep. The same way they were before they were born. They just sleep. The only difference before they were born and now is that when they die, there is a record of whether good or bad. That's the difference. But the same way you were before you were born, you sleep. You cease to exist. Daniel, brothers and sisters, is very clear about this subject. Many, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. How many? Many. Where are they? They are sleeping. They are not praising the Lord in heaven. They are not seated with the Lord. No. They are asleep. Where are they sleeping? In the dust of the earth. They shall awake. Some to everlasting life. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. Nathan the prophet told David and these words that Nathan told David are quite informative for the purpose of the study that we are having today. This is what Nathan tells David. And when thy days be fulfilled 
Thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. Thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. So it means that the fathers, where are the fathers? They are sleeping. David is fathers, the grandfather and the great grandfather, and everything, they were they, they are sleeping. That's why the prophet Nathan is saying, When your days are fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with your fathers. So Nathan the prophet understood, not like the modern preacher who lies to his people that your relative is in heaven, he is with the Lord. No, 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 no. Your relative is not with the Lord. Your dead relatives are asleep. They are sleeping in the dust of the earth. The story of Jesus, Mary, and Martha, when their brother Lazarus died, becomes very educative. And like me, brothers and sisters, I want you to believe what the Bible says. John chapter 11 verse 15. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus and her sister and Lazarus. But Jesus Christ loves you as well. That's the whole reason why he gave his life on the cross. He loves you. Do not deny his love. He cannot deny himself. God is love. And he has poured out that love on the cross. Even right now, he yearns for your life. He yearns that you will give it to him. Because he has come that you might have life and have it in abundance. <clears throat> so, Jesus Christ is with the disciples and as he is with the disciples, he tells them about the news of Lazarus. That Lazarus is dead. But he uses the word sleep. Because Jesus Christ believed the scriptures. And I want you to believe the scriptures. Believe every word of God. Live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Don't believe what your bishop tells you. Or what your pastor tells you. Remember, do not trust in princes or in man. Trust in God. You trust in God by believing his word. As Jesus Christ is seated, he tells his disciples, our friend Lazarus sleeps. But I go that I may bring him down from heaven. Is that what it says? No. It says our friend Lazarus sleeps. But I go that I may I wake him up. People in heaven don't sleep. Lazarus sleeps. But I go that I may wake him up. It's important, brothers and sisters, to understand that the disciples did not understand what Christ meant by sleep. So he then decided to speak to them plainly because they told him. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. Because he who sleeps wakes up unless you die in your sleep. <laughs> but then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So all throughout scripture, death is called a sleep. And it's indeed a sleep. Because the word of God says it's a sleep. So death is not, there's no way why it says it is a, a pathway to another life. No, it is a sleep. 
It's a, it's a coma before the new life begins. And the new life begins at the resurrection of the just and at the resurrection of the wicked. So Lazarus is dead and Jesus Christ comes out very plainly. But of course you, you don't need to be like the disciples because I've told you that death is asleep. So if Jesus Christ says Joseph is sleeping, you should understand. John chapter 11 verse 15. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe nevertheless, let us go to him. So he tells them, it's good that I wasn't there at the time when Lazarus died, so that you may see the power of God. Let us go to him and sleep. Four days, brothers and sisters, passed from the time Lazarus died. Four days. This was just to make sure that there are no tricks. Because when Jesus Christ had resurrected the daughter of uh, Jairus, when he had resurrected uh, so many other people, there could have been doubts as to whether those people were really dead. So what he decides to do this time, he allows time to pass. Four days. And I told you that when someone dies, corruption kicks in at that very point. The only one when they died, corruption did not kick in is Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the bread that comes down from heaven. He is the manna of God on which we must subsist. If you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, you've got life in you. So, in the wilderness, manna would be there for six days. Sunday to Friday. And the manna that was picked on Friday would be fresh on the seventh day. Then there will be fresh manna on a Sunday. So, Christ Represented by that manner, on Friday when he died, on Sabbath in the grave, he did not rot. Thou shalt not leave thy holy one to see corruption. And so Christ says, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe nevertheless, let us go to him. So, Mary sees Jesus Christ and he tells Jesus Christ, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have gone to heaven. Is that what Mary says? Lord, if you had not been here, my brother would not have gone to the realm. Oh, Lord, if you had, you had been here, my brother would not have gone to Pagator. No. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. He would not have died. Then Christ speaks to Mary. Jesus said to her, your brother will come down from heaven. Your brother will come from Pagatur. No, your brother will rise again. And when he is ex when he's addressing Mary, talking about Lazarus, he's addressing Lazarus as a complete entity. Lazarus is in the grave. So don't separate. So you, you, you are not, a human being is not the spirit that goes back to God. No. That, that's not a human being. Because that spirit that goes back to God, or the breath, that goes back. It's the same breath that you find even in animals. So he says Lazarus will rise again. He's addressing Lazarus as a complete entity. He will rise again. And then at least Mary understood the doctrine of what happens when you die. 
Because the answer that she gives here is very informative. She says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So she wasn't saying, no, I know that uh, my brother is in heaven or somewhere. No, I know that he will rise again. Remember, if the dead rise not again, then we who believe in Christ are more miserable. But praise God that the dead rise again at the resurrection. But Christ did not mean that Lazarus will rise at the resurrection. Yes, there will be people that will rise at the resurrection, but to show the power of God, Lazarus was to be risen that very day after four days. And there's a song that goes like, even after four days, God is still not, he's still on time. He is still on time. John chapter 11 verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. Christ is the resurrection. He is also life. Outside Christ, there is no life. Outside Christ, there is no life. Even the witchcraft that you are practicing cannot protect you in the face of death. All the medicine that you put around your bed or to secure your position at work cannot protect you when it comes to death. You only get life from Christ because he is life. In him there is life and borrowed. I am the resurrection and the life. And then he says, he who believes in me, though he die, he shall live. So you see, when you die, you will live because Christ has got the power to resurrect you. He then takes them to the tomb. When he takes them to the tomb, at the tomb there, Martha is telling him, look, Lord, I, uh, my brother has been in there for four days. But there's something also that happens here to show Christ's concern for the human race. Jesus wept. But Christ did not weep as we weep. Christ wept because a number of you listening to me right now will not believe his word. A number of you listening to what I am talking about will choose to believe something else. That's the reason why he wept. He wept because a number of you will choose not to follow the way of God. My brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ wept. Does he still weep over your life? Because of you rejecting the offer of salvation that he has given to you? Do not reject the offer so freely given to you. Or the truth that cost the life of the dear son of God. There was a stone on the tomb and Christ requested that the stone be rolled away and the stone was rolled away. There is something that you as a human being you must do. And God also does his part. That stone was to be removed by human beings. And then God performs that which you can't perform. You and I, brothers and sisters, can't save ourselves. But we can place ourselves in the hands of God. 
to save us. John chapter 11 verse 9. But Lord, by this time there is a bad order, for he has been there for four days. That's the only contribution Lazarus could do at this time. That's the only contribution. Bad order. But then, on that day, the life and the resurrection was present. Christ was present. He looks into the tomb. And what does he do? He calls out Lazarus by name. Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. You see, in the face of the voice of Christ, death, death, let's go of its victims. In the face of the voice of God, death, let's go of its victims. Lazarus, come forth. Well, I can assure you that if Christ had said, let the dead come forth, everyone alive uh, who was dead from Abel would have come forth. But their time was not yet. So he calls out the name of Lazarus. Because only Lazarus at that time was required to come up. But in the resurrection, he might call your name. If you believe in him. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ will resurrect the dead. He will bring them again to life. I beseech you by the message of God to be on the side of Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope, like the pagans during the time of the Roman Empire, who would write on the tombstones, goodbye forever. No, Christians write goodbye till we meet again. So the Apostle Paul addressing the Thessalonians, he tells them, do not weep like those who've got no hope. Christians look forward to the resurrection. When Christ will break the eastern skies, and when he breaks the eastern skies, in power, in great glory, he will come. And death will be powerless to keep hold of those that it has held on from the time Abel died up until that point, brothers and sisters. Powerless. So don't sorrow like those without hope. Because you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, don't sorrow like the pagans. But at the same time also, I want to speak to you, don't waste your money to pay and to enrich priests and bishops by paying for your dead relatives. They will just eat your money. Nothing will happen to your dead relative. Your dead relatives are not in purgatory. They are in the graves. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ. The dead in Christ will rise first. So already here, the Apostle Paul makes a distinction of who rises first. The wicked do not rise when Christ comes the, first, the second time. They remain sleeping in their graves. And we're going to look at that subject, evil in chains. 
what happened during the time of the 1000 period. This is the beginning of the 1000 years. When the dead in Christ rise. So the next time you are at the funeral, those that are in the coffin, friends, are sleeping. Parents, do everything possible for your children whilst there's still breath in their nostrils to choose Jesus Christ. You can't help them when they get in the coffin. You can't help your wife. You can't help your husband. You can't help anyone when they get there. They sleep. Are waiting for Christ to give to each man as his work shall be. Behold, I tell you a mystery. The Apostle Paul is making another argument here. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. So he's saying not all human beings will die. But that's a subject for another day. There is a group of people who will not sleep, see death. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed. Remember Job was saying, I will wait for my change till the heavens be normal. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Remember the trump of God? The archangel, when Christ descends and the dead in Christ rise first, those who are alive in Christ are changed. It is at this moment, brothers and sisters, that human beings receive immortality. So human beings do not have an immortal soul. They receive immortality at the second coming of Christ. Right now, I will show you that the only one who has immortality is God. So at the last trumpet, we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. So the dead, when they rise, and this is the good news, my brothers and sisters, when the dead rise, they rise incorruptible. Meaning that which used to affect us before the resurrection cannot affect us again. We are changed. Incorruptible. Our bodies shall be changed to be like Christ's. And the short and the tall and those who don't like themselves, Christ will change us. The effects of sin will be done away at the resurrection. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So it is at that stage that human beings become immortal or they receive immortality. So right now, human beings are mortal and they don't have an immortal soul. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in what? In victory. And then as we rise, then we shall say, all oh, heads, where is your victory? All oh, death, where is your sting? Victory. 
is guaranteed in Christ. I told you that Christ will defeat death as the last enemy. He has already defeated it, but his children are still trapped in that. John chapter 5, verse 28, as I close. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. And come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Heaven or hell at the resurrection. Not that death, at the resurrection. At the resurrection. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. So, the dead, my brothers and sisters, are peacefully sleeping. Peacefully sleeping. And Christ at the second coming. Wonderful, wonderful news. How beautiful it shall be. With all the thousands of angels coming forth. Uniting husband and wife. Mother and child. Babies to their mother's arms. Just how beautiful it shall be. This is going to happen. Not your Hollywood fiction movies which don't happen. This is truth. Then we, brothers and sisters, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So the dead will rise and then the living will be caught up. But these are the living righteous at the first coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. That is when you will go to heaven. At the resurrection. Not when you die. At the resurrection. That is when you go to heaven. So those that have chosen trust, wonderful news about what God will do to death. The subject of the thief on the cross has had so many people getting confused. Others say, no, he went to heaven that day, but the Bible is very clear. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So the subject here is a question of how was it written in the original and how was it written when the translations and the commas and the footstops were added and Jesus said to him assuredly I said to you today you will be with me in paradise now just moving where the comma should be there we can change the meaning of what that means the truth of the matter is that Christ was telling the thief on the cross that I'm telling you today that you will be with me in paradise. He was not telling him that today you will be with me in paradise. No. I'm telling you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. Not I'm telling you today you will be with me in paradise. You see what a simple comma does. It changes the meaning of everything. And did Jesus go to paradise that day? The question is no. Cross never went to paradise on that day. On Friday he died. He was buried. On Sabbath he was resting in the tomb as his custom was. Because Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. So he was resting. Come Sunday morning. Christ resurrects. Christ defeats death. And as he comes up there. Later on. He meets with Mary. And Mary, when he goes to the tomb, he sees someone and he thinks that someone is the gardener. 
He says, they have taken my Lord. She's weeping. And then he asked to wear. And then he, later on, the eyes of Mary are opened. And then she realizes that actually is Jesus Christ. She tries to touch Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ tells her, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. So Christ, when he died, he didn't go to heaven. He was in the grave. John 20 verse 17. I have not yet ascended to my father. When he died, he did not ascend into heaven. Neither did he go to preach to the souls during the time of Noah. No. He did not go to preach to the souls during the time of Noah. Like some believe. No. Christ, when he died, on Sabbath he was in the tomb. On Friday he was put in the tomb. On Sunday in the morning he resurrected. He did not go anywhere. Because the dead do not go anywhere. Therefore, because the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So they had asked that you break these, the legs of these people who are on the cross so that in case on Sabbath they run away. So break their legs. Okay? So when they, they came to Christ, they discovered that Christ had already died. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. And the prophecy that he keeps all his bones was, was fulfilled. Okay? So that Friday, Christ died. On Sabbath, he was resting on the tomb. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. So Christ did not go to heaven, which means that the thief also did not go to heaven. So, brothers and sisters, the, how we read the Bible is very important. 1 Timothy chapter 4, chapter 6, verse 15 which is in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potent, potent, the king of kings and lord of lords, who only hath immortality. So the apostle Paul makes an argument here that the only one with immortality is God. Who only has immortality. And you did hear, I told you, that immortality will only be given to the children of God at the second coming of Christ. Now, it came to pass as our soul was in departing. The word soul, as used there, the original word that was used here for soul is nafesh. And the word nafesh, brothers and sisters, simply means to breathe. And that's another one for you. Rua. Rua. And what does the word Rua mean? For dust as it was. And the spirit. So the word spirit. The original word used there is Rua. Which simply means wind by resemblance breath. So the spirit that goes back to God. Or the Rua. That goes back to God is the breath. What about that one? What do you pick, brothers and sisters? The original Hebrew word used there is gava, which means to breathe out. To breathe out. That means to expire or be dead. So, not some uh, form of uh, uh, conscious entity because the word ghost as used today in our modern setting is different with how it was used there the word the ghost does not mean some entity that moves no, it's the word gather, to breathe out to expire, to die and Jesus 
cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. The word used there for ghost is ekpan, which means to expire, to give up the ghost. What about that one, my brothers and sisters? What do you pick from there? So you see, when we study the Bible diligently, we actually pick up that man does not have an immortal soul. Man is a soul. And he dies. In closing, a story is told of a missionary family who had been carrying out their missionary activities in Africa. And the child, their little boy, they had the boy who was struck with malaria. When the child was struck with malaria, he later died. The family was devastated, but because they believed in God, God gave them the comfort and the strength to endure this loss. Later on, as the man of the house or the husband was out in the field conducting evangelistic campaigns, the wife was alone at home. She heard someone come into the house. And that someone was the son. So when she looked at the so-called son, or the form that appeared to be the son, everything, the voice was that of a son, the looks was that of the son. But the woman knew what happens when we die. She then decided to rebuke the form in front of her and told her that you are not my son and the form changed from being the son into an evil angel and disappeared. Today, brothers and sisters, there are many of you that will experience these things. But the word of God should give you the comfort that when this happens, stand on the word of God. Tell the demons that the dead know nothing. And in the front, in the face of the word of God, the devil will flee. Brothers and sisters, may God help us to believe the word of God. And the invitation is to you. Trust is able to comfort you in your loss. Trust is able to give us a new heart. He comforts those who believe in him. Come to Jesus Christ. Believe in him. Believe in the word of God. Father, we thank you for the privilege to study the word of God. It is so wonderful to know what the Bible says about this subject. That when we die, we sleep. Oh Lord, my prayer is that someone out there will hear this message and accept the truth for what it is so that they may stop believing the lie that the devil has thrown out there. Let them believe the word of God. And believing the word of God will ensure that we've got peace and peace that transcends all understanding. I pray that you will bless us. I pray that Christ will come and live in us. I pray that Christ will comfort us even in these troublous times. I pray that Christ will comfort those that have lost their loved ones. But let them choose you. 
And when they choose you, Father, the hope is that you will come again and you will resurrect those that believe in Christ. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.